Numerical acoustics can be developed in the form of finite elements or boundary elements, and then there are several types of boundary element. But historically, the first acoustic element was a finite element, and we're going to study that in this lecture. It's pretty straightforward material. It's fairly accessible to structural mechanics people, such as myself, although I have to say I've had a little background in aeroelasticity as well. Um, but the fluid mechanics here fits very well into the schemes that structural mechanics people are used to in creating finite elements. So it's a very straightforward technology. We're going to use a triangular two-dimensional finite element for an example, and then we're going to show a line element. We're going to show the convergence of such a line element as you get more and more of them uh, in order to reproduce the uh, normal modes in a finite length duct. The dominant theory that's used is Glurkin's method. We will use the velocity potential as the uh, fluid concept. Uh, Glurkin's method is more generally one of the weighted residual methods. Um, we'll hit the triangular element pretty hard, uh, do a numerical example with a line element, and then go into our problem session. We're going to use the velocity potential as the fluid mechanics tool for developing our element. First, we'll summarize the equations of motion for such a fluid flow. The continuity equation, sometimes called conservation of mass, is a scalar equation. I'll use this little symbol on the right to show that you're worried about conservation of flow going out of the element and relating that to the uh, time rate of change of density of that uh, control volume there. In momentum, you have a vector equation in 3D uh, involving uh, basically accelerations and pressure gradients. We will use the linearized law for adiabatic change. Um, generally speaking, you have the relation for a pressure and a density perturbation where you can see that c squared then would be dp d rho, and we've talked about that earlier. And then for the adiabatic law, that would be related to the square root of gamma rt. So um, these two are actually coupled rather closely together, and then the adiabatic rule uh, assumed. These fundamental equations are now manipulated to give the wave equation expressed in a velocity potential form. And then we'll convert that further into the Helmholtz equation in terms of the velocity potential. First of all, we look at the momentum equation and take the curl of that, and that means del cross into that uh, vector quantity and setting that to be zero. Um, since you have a repeated del cross del here in the right hand term, that's going to vanish because the curl of two vectors that are identical is zero. And here you have then this cross product of the uh, velocity perturbation. If we interchange, uh, as I've done here, the spatial and the time derivatives and then neglect the um, ambient density, we'll get this expression which says that the time rate of change of this quantity is, is zero. That means the quantity underlined here, which is called vorticity, won't change in time and it's a constant. Uh, we will set that constant to be zero, um, perhaps seemingly arbitrarily, but really not, because our reference state is going to be for quiescent fluid. Um, if we were to have some kind of initial fluid field, then this might not be true, but in our case it's strictly true. And when you have such an expression, you then can infer, and, and the logic is perhaps a little bit inverse here, that if the 
uh, curl of a vector field is zero, then the vector field itself can be expressed as the um, as the gradient of a scalar field, and I'll define that in the next figure. I'll write out the velocity perturbation as a gradient of a field variable phi, shown here. And expanding that gradient, it's in our case the spatial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, acting on this function of space. And this then will satisfy zero vorticity identically because taking the curl of this will lead to uh, identically zero. Now I wanted to show a little more here and I'm skipping to a one-dimensional version of the discussion just to make it a little bit easier. For instance, suppose we take the momentum equation shown here and with an oblique force field to show that the fluid field is moving basically in a, in a three-dimensional way and I write out the momentum equation, but then I convert that to the simpler form for field motion described only in the x direction. Then my gradient term becomes only a partial on x. I do the interchange of space and time derivative again. Uh, and then I'm able to bring out the uh, del operating on the pressure field here, the perturbed pressure field. You now have that there's a spatial derivative which is zero. Now we've gotten a partial differential equation in terms of the spatial variable x and then time. When you show that the derivative on space is zero, that means if you do an integration along the spatial direction, you'll find that the uh, resulting uh, parenthetical quantity has to be only a function of time, sort of an integration constant, but really a function of time. And this, here's what was the parenthetical quantity in here. And we're going to take this, quote, integration constant to be zero because we don't care to have a um, perturbation quantity in here that's um, varying uniformly in space. I guess that's somewhat arbitrary, but we'll just, we'll just do that and then solve for the pressure perturbation as a function of the time derivative of the velocity potential. Now that's universal, it turns out, even in three dimensions. So we'll be able to use that result. And it's easier to drive in this fashion. Now we return to the three-dimensional continuity equation, and we can use this result in a second. Um, first, we um, density variation uh, using the adiabatic argument by a pressure variation and the speed of sound. And secondly, we, we can take the pressure variation here and put it in terms of the uh, velocity potential, as we have just done above. At this level up here, actually, that goes, uh, is going to go into there, and then to give us what we have down here. Um, instead of uh, this perturbation on velocity, we'll use the gradient of the uh, potential field. Coming down to the next step, we'll combine those two um, delta operators into the delta squared or the Laplacian. We'll cancel the density, the ambient density, and now you're left with an equation involving two time derivatives on the velocity potential and two space derivatives, or what really in three dimensions a second derivative in the form of Laplacian, to be zero. That's already in the form of a wave equation. And so just by rearranging terms, we get the wave equation in the potential form shown here, involving the speed of sound and uh, second derivatives on phi. Boundary conditions are usually uh, either put on pressure or velocity perturbations.
and the pressure one immediately converts into a time derivative on phi and the velocity immediately converts into a space derivative on phi. If we now assume harmonic wave motion, and we usually do this because we, we usually work in the frequency domain in our actual problem solving, uh, then we'll factor that e to the i omega t out as a product and we will convert the wave equation into Helmholtz equation. What was once uh, a minus and a second derivative on time up here will now become plus and then you're going to have a omega over c quantity squared which is the wave number squared. This time we get the positive sign and here's the uh, time derivative involved over here coming out now as a, a minus i omega term and here's a space derivative. So this um, pressure relation here is is useful, can be converted trivially into the wave number uh, relation shown here. So this basically gives us our field equation and some useful boundary conditions. Now that we have the field equation and some suggested uh, boundary conditions, we can try to develop the relevant equations on a closed domain that we would call a finite element. And one way to do this is a weighted residual method, namely that you try to minimize the error in your approximation over the domain of the problem. So if we were to integrate, say, over the volume of some proposed region, which for us will be a finite element, we would take the Helmholtz equation here and then use a weight uh, w and then integrate over the volume in question. By setting that to zero you've then implied that you've done the best job you can in an average way to remove the error in whatever approximate values you choose for the phi which is our um, answer. Well one way to handle that equation is to use Green's first identity and work on this second derivative term up above and try to turn that into first derivative terms. This is often done in these weighted residual approaches because it's a smoothing process it turns out to uh, work with lower derivatives. So uh, when you do this you get a boundary term uh, which involves the first derivative namely uh, in the normal direction to the surface uh, times the weight over here. And the product that you have, you see, is del squared phi times w d volume. And uh, the w is unchanged, but you go one integral up on the um, phi variable and get this normal derivative. And then the volume integral with a minus sign on it um, has the first derivative of both of the functions involved. The um, other term carries straight away down below without any modification. We'll now look at the surface terms involved in that uh, relation. One area of the surface called S sub P is where the pressure is specified and given a, a functional value say phi tilde. The other area, S sub V, is where velocity is specified and given some functional values, say gamma. So this gamma is basically an outflow of velocity over that surface. Now, we're going to not worry about the error caused by the uh, surface effects on this surface S sub P. One way to explain that is to say that we'll pick weight functions that are zero on that surface. The argument is actually tougher than that. Uh, it's actually easier to see in, in some other related um, developments using virtual work or potential energy, but it's, uh, it's known that this term needs to be removed. And so therefore, on the 
uh, after some reduction in terms here, on the right side there would have been two integrals, one on SU, the other one on S uh, sub P, but we're going to neglect this one by saying the weight function is zero over that surface. And we're left then with this um, slightly rewritten equation here. I'll just kind of draw a great big box. Um, now the right-hand side uh, actually becomes like a forcing function on the rest of the problem where this is a uh, flow-induced uh, type of force on this, the response of this system. Now let's develop some specific finite elements. The heart of this approach is to use shape functions and these are interpolating polynomials that are chosen to give unit values at a home node and then zero values at other nodes. We need to consider a series solution for the field variable phi here, and this is after you've factored out the time dependence, in which these are the shape functions n sub j, and then there are nodal values phi sub j, uh, which initially would have been functions of time, uh, now are considered to be constants. And these measure the magnitude of uh, phi then in a harmonic oscillating situation. The elements themselves could be a tetrahedra, a hexa element, a wedge element here, or a so-called pentahedra. The shape functions that are used can fall into several families. There are Lagrange polynomials and there are serendipity functions, which we're interested in here. The serendipity functions are those that are in a product form and they're most easily generated when one has mapped the physical element onto a double unit square, say here, or a double unit cube in three dimensions. Uh, the physical element might be oblique, but the parent element is a square or a cube. And because these node points are regularly spaced, it's pretty easy to guess what a set of shape functions should be. For instance, if you want a shape function that has a unit value here and zero values at these other three points, you can just take the equations for lines that pass through these two and these two and take the product of those and you'll end up with a quadratic surface that will have the required properties. Um, this will be done in the C1, C2 plane and so your shape functions are written initially as functions of C1 and C2 and then with the nodal values uh, in that C plane. Let's start by looking at the first shape function. This one should have a unit value at the first node down here with coordinates uh, of minus one, minus one. And you can see that this product will do the job by substituting C1 to be minus one and getting a value of two for this parenthetical term. And C2 is minus one, gives a value of two as well divided by four, you've got uh, two times two divided by four, lo and behold that works. And then the other shape functions in turn can be developed. In each case these are actually equations of straight lines and in the sense that there would be a third coordinate, um, even if you wish call it uh, C3 equals a function of C1 and C2 and then rather than setting um, this quantity to be zero, which would give you the locus of the, um, of the line in question, you just leave it not zero and then treat it as a surface. So that's how you can develop this product form. We're going to use the same functions for our weighting functions as we used for our trial functions and often that's referred to as Galerkin's method. So that um, these shape functions n sub i appear as weights in several places in this same equation. 
and you have then the other terms which were the first derivative terms and uh, here are the boundary terms. If we carry out an expansion of the velocity function here, a velocity potential in terms of unknown coefficients phi j times the shape functions nj, then we get in each case this series uh, that shows up. Now, when you have derivatives which are uh, occurring here, then you'll bring those derivatives inside the summation, and in each case, uh, depending on the coordinate in, in question, you'll really end up taking derivatives of shape functions with respect to these coordinates. And these are indeed known quantities, whereas the nodal value now becomes the unknown quantity. It's now necessary to rearrange terms. And what's commonly done is to take the integral into the summation by passing it through the summation sign. Now these uh, processes we've discussed in, involve derivatives, integrals, and summations. And these are finite sums, these are proper integrals, and we're assuming that the functions are smooth so that the derivatives are well behaved. And that's what allows us to interchange those operations. That comes out of advanced calculus. So after having regrouped terms and bringing the integral inside, you start noticing some packages here, such as this del ni, del nj, and, and uh, that will be given a term, kij, shown below here. That becomes a kind of an acoustic stiffness in, in analogy with the structural stiffness. Then um, here's a term that shows up with an ni, ni, the displacement field, or in originally a velocity field squared. This was related to a kinetic energy initially, and when you have the k in it, you'll, you'll get something closer to that. Uh, the integral itself might be thought of as a mass term, and it's given the coefficient m with subscript ij. And then on the right-hand side is a volume flow per unit time, and now this has been integrated in a way that gives you a nodal volume flow positive out of the node. There's no direction implied uh, in terms of east, west, north, south. These, this is a scalar type of load that uh, 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 is a flow coming out of the node, so there isn't any particular direction implied. And that would be similar to current in a node in an electrical circuit, uh, whether into or out of the particular node. So up to this point, these have been general relations, and we now have the general formulas for finite elements. Now let's develop an acoustic triangular element. This will be kind of fun, and uh, it will be the equivalent of a Turner triangle, that is, a constant strain stress element. It's going to be two-dimensional. It's going to have thickness h, so that when we get to volume integration, we'll have to uh, integrate through the thickness as well. And we're going to try to find the uh, so-called pressure energy and the kinetic energy terms. Now, these are basically the stiffness and the mass terms for this element. And then let's find the equivalent nodal acoustic flux due to the velocity field capital gamma on the bottom surface, and that's a uh, mass flow out of the element. So that should be a positive type of uh, equivalent nodal flux. First we'll develop the shape functions for this particular triangle, and they're written here the N2 and N3 versions are probably the easiest to uh, tell because they are just proportionately these planes that, um, that pass through the home node. And N3 in particular is the one that's illustrated over here. Then we have to evaluate the pressure um, 
energy term here, which is the first derivative of the shape function shown below, turning that into uh, specific uh, shape functions yields these terms. What was a constant strain element in structures now becomes a constant velocity element in acoustics. Um, I'll just evaluate those terms for the case of K11, and you get this resulting uh, pressure term, pressure energy term, or stiffness. Here's K12, K13. The remaining three stiffness terms are shown in this next figure. One of them is zero, which is interesting. But the others all have finite symbolic values. Let's assemble all of those terms into a pressure matrix. That's shown here. The element thickness is uh, uniformly found in each of the terms. Then the acoustic mass is a real uh, terror, and I'll do that without much comment. Uh, we'll take a typical term shown here, and you have to integrate this uh, over the triangular region, which is not trivial this time because um, you don't have derivatives to turn these into constants, so you're actually integrating polynomials over a triangular region. In any event, uh, here's a portion of the calculation uh, which is finished on the next page. And here's the final value. And coming out with this answer. Then I collect results and put it into this mass matrix or kinetic energy matrix. And an interesting thing is that the total mass terms, when added up, add up to the triangle volume. So this is a volumetric type of a matrix. And uh, since it's um, one dimensional in the structural sense that a pressure goes up or down as a scalar, it's not a vector, uh, therefore the sum total of terms add up to just one times the uh, mass of the triangular volume. Lastly, we'll do the equivalent nodal fluxes due to that flux capital gamma on the bottom. And that's the inner product shown here of the specified flow times the shape function evaluated on that edge. By putting in the shape function and the proper uh, uh, evaluation here, turning the crank, you get this quantity, gamma HB over 2. This would be the flux acting on node number 1, positive outward, and uh, we do get a positive quantity, which we had expected. The other two equivalent nodal fluxes are found in the same way. And here, gamma 2, with the constant outward flow times the shape function N2 evaluated on that bottom edge. Turning the crank, you get another gamma BH over 2, which is uh, this quantity shown here. So we've gotten these two now. When you do the third one, however, you find that by evaluating N3 along the cut edge at the bottom is identically zero shown here. And so this time we get no equivalent nodal flux up at this top node due to an imposed outflow of volume on the bottom edge. That should ring familiar to those people who understand the constant strain triangle in structural mechanics. And then here is the total equivalent nodal flux vector in which you get um, half of the outflow occurring at each of the two nodes. Now let's look at a numerical example and see how well our finite element idea performs. Here's a 
rather large element, pretty much room size, 10 meters on a side, which would be in English measure about 33 feet by 33 feet, but in a triangular shape. So there wouldn't be many rooms really shaped like this. Uh, the question is to find the normal modes and frequencies of this uh, particular shaped element. I'll use uh, rather standard values for density and speed of sound. The speed of sound is a little cooler than um, some people take as a, uh, it's and therefore a little slower than some typical values. I've used a, a numerical value out of Pierce's book that he used in some examples. So. These are not exactly standard uh, temperature and pressure at sea level. These are uh, just arbitrary values chosen. And using our uh, stiffness matrix for acoustics, um, we have this matrix. And then putting in the dimensions in the meter kilogram second system, we have this matrix on the right. In acoustics, you can check the possibility of a constant pressure mode, which corresponds to a rigid body mode in structural mechanics, by looking at the determinant of that acoustic pressure matrix or stiffness matrix. When we do that, we find that the determinant of the matrix is zero. That means it's singular, and that there do exist zero eigenvalues to this uh, dynamic problem that we pose below. Uh, in this case, there will be one such zero frequency corresponding to an elevation and pressure uniformly over the element. Um, when we do pose the dynamic equations of motion here with both this uh, stiffness and, and inertia term, uh, we get this form. It's natural to bring out an eigenvalue lambda defined here in terms of the uh, wave number. And from this, we're hoping now to solve in a formal way this eigenvalue problem. It's in the standard form, it turns out, when we choose to not allow volume flow into any of the three nodes. And that corresponds to an element that has rigid walls and doesn't permit flow in or out of the boundaries. Therefore, none of the three uh, equivalent nodal volume fluxes it will have any value. They'll all be zero. So that leaves us with the unknowns shown here of the three nodal um, velocity potential terms. Our goal is to find the eigenvalues of this general eigenvalue problem. And the eigenvalues themselves will be related to the frequency of vibration of that ma mass of air contained within the triangular element. Uh, then the modes, or the mode shapes, are going to be the pressure fields, basically, throughout that same element, and give us some idea of how the uh, fluid is packing against one wall when it's under compression, or moving away from the wall when it's uh, in a uh, rarefaction. And uh, we'll see that in a minute. Here is the equation of motion again in a uh, form with the eigenvalue shown. You combine the terms, and you have this form of the equation, something like a dynamical matrix here on a, an eigenvector. Uh, and basically, you're mapping the eigenvector into zero, the zero vector. The condition that you can do this is that the equation here is singular. The set of equations is singular. And you check that by the determinant of the, uh, the total dynamical matrix here on the left. When you set that to be 0, there's a common factor of lambda outside, which shows that there's one zero frequency involved. That's that constant pressure mode. But then, using the quadratic formula, you find two other frequencies given here. They come out in simple ratios uh, 1 and 3. And then we can interpret that in terms of frequencies in the next figure. We recover the frequencies of vibration from that eigenvalue. And that's done here. Then putting the frequencies uh, 
uh, closer and closer to a final numerical form. We, we express it in terms of the lambda. And then we get this form. Finally, we, we substitute the actual eigenvalues of the um, problem that we found, the 0, the 1, and the 3. And then we recover, and then putting in the proper uh, other constants here, we put in um, lambda 1 is 0. Call it the lowest, uh, which is a zero frequency, and then you get zero uh, here. Lambda two had a unit value, which is put in on the right side here, and that gives you 18 hertz. Lambda three, which was a three value, gives you roughly 32 hertz. So those are the frequencies of that entrained air inside that uh, closed triangular box. So we now have the frequencies, uh, roughly 0, 18, and 32 hertz. Uh, now, to what kind of a velocity and pressure distribution do those correspond? Well, we find the eigenvectors to do that. And by the way, the method that we just used for a single element uh, is called the determinant method for finding the eigenvalues. That's actually pretty old-fashioned nowadays. That's not used so much. It's only valid for small problems. When you use the determinant method to find the eigenvalues, then you can substitute back in and find the eigenvector terms by uh, elimination, by a Gauss elimination sort of a procedure. Um, here I write out the equations for the lambda zero case shown here. And uh, you can solve these simultaneously by taking equations two and three and uh, working with them. And you'll get that phi two is the same as phi one. And then finally, phi three is the same as phi one. Uh, that gives you then a vector, an eigenvector, the first one by this subscript outside the uh, curly braces, an eigenvector that has the same value in each component. Uh, we normalize that arbitrarily to have a unit value shown here. And I show it as this elevated surface, where phi is uh, above the xy plane and shows these phi values. Now, the closest thing we could easily approximate that to is a pressure field. So, and, and there's some complex relation there, but it's, it's good just to think of it as pressure. And you see that what you have then is the equivalent of a small pressure induced into that chamber and which raises uniformly the pressure in the entire chamber. And uh, it's a degenerate vibration at zero frequency. For the second mode, we'll do something similar by putting back the uh, eigenvalue lambda equal to unity and putting it into the acoustic pressure matrix or stiffness matrix, uh, looking for a zero determinant of that matrix. And um, what we get is this form um, here where phi 2 and phi 3 are related, in fact, in, a, in, a, in an inverse way with a minus sign. Um, the second in, uh, equation can be worked on to give phi 1 is 0. And that means that you have a pressure field normalized here with 0 in the first term and unity in the second minus unity in the third. And it's kind of a teeter-totter shape shown here for the pressure field. Now what that really means is that you've got a wave traveling along this long dimension of the um, element along the hypotenuse. It's actually angled uh, in this view here. It's a little hard to see. But then um, the air will, on one half of the cycle, compress in this uh, side. And then on the next half, will compress on the far side. Um, since velocities go like derivatives of, of this function, you do have a bit of a paradox where there's a mismatch in velocity at this boundary. And uh, that's something that, that, that mismatch is something that we've hoped to minimize with the Glurkin method. 
uh, that error is uh, a part of the approximate nature of this particular body. You'd wonder how can the how can the fluid pass through the wall if it has a velocity there, but uh, if you look into the theory, you find that that's not an exact boundary condition in this problem. Uh, nevertheless, that frequency then of roughly 18 hertz is about what the wave speed is for a, a wave basically traveling the long dimension of the um, element and then rebounding and ultimately setting up a standing wave because of its uh, sister wave going in the opposite direction. And then these are the pressure magnitudes. Let's now look at the third mode and find the pressures at the nodes in that case. There we have lambda of 3. We put that into this dynamical matrix, finding this uh, reduced matrix numerically then the question is, can you find phi 1, phi 2, phi 3? Now the determinant of this is going to be zero if you check it out. Um, and that was a condition by which we originally found the lambda to be 3. Uh, this time we do have to solve simultaneously with equations 2 and 1 being subtracted, and this time you get that phi 3 and phi 2 are the same. Uh, the Equation 1 is combined with equation 3 to get this value that phi 2 is half of phi 1. And adding those results, we get the third eigenvector shown below here. That doesn't um, tell you very much. You need the figure shown over here to see what it is. Notice that this time we have a unit height uh, on the... Uh, origin there where the one corner of the element is, and then along the hypotenuse you only have the minus 0.5 terms. What that does is establish a nodal line in the Chladni sense, um, a third of the way across here, and I have to project that uh, into the uh, xy plane and find the intersection. And that means that on this particular half of the cycle shown, you've got the fluid rushing to the left and compressing against the, uh, the origin here. And then on the opposite half of the cycle, it would, the fluid would return to the other direction, um, causing actually a focusing effect at the point over here and giving higher pressures by a factor of two than when it rushes to the other side and rebounds. So it's an interesting focusing idea. This time we're finding what we're basically getting in a top view is the frequencies in a closed con uh, container where the fluid is rushing back and forth perpendicular to the longest dimension, which is the hypotenuse. And um, so this would naturally be a higher frequency because it has the shortest wavelength that you might propose for fluid to move in that chamber. It's instructive now to do a sanity check on this set of results for frequencies. Uh, I think we've already got a sanity check on the mode shape because it seems to make sense, but we'll talk about those as well. Uh, certainly starting with the constant pressure mode, that's a physically realizable sort of situation. One way you could um, idealize that situation would be if there was a small puff of air put into the chamber and then the, uh, then the opening was sealed, that would uniformly raise the pressure in the chamber and then it would stay there. Since we have fixed boundary uh, boundaries here that are reflective sealed boundaries. Now, of course, this takes a small perturbation to imagine that and that's always done in the sense of uh, an eigenvalue problem that you, you have to assume that there's some event that would cause the uh, eigenvector to oscillate, but once it started, it maintains itself. In this case, the constant pressure field maintains itself. And I like to think of it as an oscillation with zero frequency. I'll plot the pressure field in the second mode in the next figure. It's shown as the shaded surface here. If you imagine that, um, in the opposite phase, where the pressure is reverse sine, then there would be a, 
surface it would pass uh, in this manner. And then there would be a Chladni nodal line along this direction from the origin out to the middle of the hypotenuse. And that would be a line on which pressures would stay zero. Currently with the phasing shown at time zero, the red surface uh, given here, there would be a positive pressure along the near face and a negative pressure on the far face. With this pressure field, it would tend to make the velocity then move particles away from the near wall in this direction. Let's concentrate on the pressure field on that cut edge of the hypotenuse, and I'll do that in the figure here on the left. The opposite phasing in time would give the dashed line, which would be the pressure reversal. One way to look at this would be to say that although we're interested in the pressures within this closed chamber, which is our triangular element, that actually by mirror images we could extend that pressure field outside the walls into neighboring mirror image elements. When we think along those lines, we realize that what we're trying to do is predict a pressure field that's actually a sine wave. I probably won't draw it very well here. <laughs> and that what we're really trying to get is a zero slope to that uh, pressure field at the wall. If I plot below then the velocity, which would be the derivative along the hypotenuse direction, I would get the um, square wave shown below. And this brings up the paradox then that you have the jump in velocity at the wall. So there's a discontinuity in the velocity boundary condition. That's okay, however. Uh, to argue that, you almost have to go into some energy concepts and show that there's no energy lost by that uh, jump. But we can take that uh, on faith. And it's also found in the Turner constant strain triangle in structural mechanics, where you get a jump across the inner element lines in strain and ultimately in stress. I'd like to make a side argument now about how standing waves are, in fact, created by two traveling waves in opposite direction with the same speed. So we'll do a mental experiment shown in the three figures below. First, at time zero, let's imagine that there's a red wave shown here which will travel to the right with speed c, the speed of sound. There's also a blue wave that will travel to the left at that same speed. They're meant to be coincident, but I've slightly offset them so you can see the different colors. We're plotting the field variable here, which is the pressure field. The characteristic length that we're interested in uh, corresponds to L here, uh, the distance between our two rigid walls, say, in our um, triangular finite element. At a time later, delta t later, which we'll take to be L over C, that would be just sufficient time for the uh, point, say, on the red wave at its peak to move over one characteristic distance, which I've uh, shown in the second figure here. Likewise, the blue wave will move uh, one characteristic distance L to the left. At this point, the two traveling waves reinforce each other again, but with opposite polarity from the top figure. Uh, you can also see that this will constitute a half um, period in time, because if we do this experiment again and, and look at 2 delta t, you will see then that the waves reinforce with their original polarity. And so that constitutes a return to the original position and what we mean by a a full cycle of motion. We can then construct what we call a frequency here, which would be one over that period. And uh, I can just sketch it here right on the drawing that frequency would equal then uh, one over the period. Well, the uh, period uh, we're talking about now is 2L over C. So it would be C over 2L. 
that's not really obvious. And I think you have to sit and think about this a bit. And um, we'll carry forward, though, this uh, concept of how you get a standing wave frequency from a traveling wave speed of sound and characteristic distance. I'll write down that formula again for the frequency here. And the thing to remember is that in a closed chamber with two reflecting walls, um, the longest wavelength possible is really twice the length of the uh, distance between the two walls. And so that this is the frequency for a closed chamber with two reflecting ends that are distance L apart. Another fundamental idea of what we've just discussed is uh, the accuracy involved in using straight line segments to interpolate what really is a sine wave. And, and by now you see that what went on between the two walls, which we uh, mentioned here with vertical lines, is really a half of a wave. And if you fill that in with the full sine wave shown here, you now see what it means to have violated the um, velocity condition at the wall means that you have this peaked uh, representation of a sine wave. Um, a related question then would be how many of these straight line segments should you use to represent a full wavelength? Um, and, and that's often the way that it's given is uh, going a full wavelength. And people often say that that's uh, a minimum of five elements. Um, electrical engineers sometimes are willing to go with fewer representations on straight line segments because they're, a lot of their measurements are logarithmic and we have a little bit of that in uh, acoustics as well because of the hearing uh, physiology. So uh, people get by with a modest number of straight line segments. In some forms of structural mechanics on stress you might rather have uh, 10 such straight line segments representing uh, something that were a sinusoidal stress field, let's say. So we've had a brief look at the mode shapes and then um, decided what traveling waves superposed to make a standing wave. I think the interesting major result was that the characteristic length of a closed chamber, call it capital L, uh, really represents a half wave when the chamber has reflective boundaries. Uh, and therefore, the wavelength is 2L. Now let's look at the frequencies involved in that closed chamber and see if we can uh, argue from that wavelength idea what those frequencies might be. There's no problem on the first zero frequency mode because that's a static pressure increase uniformly throughout the chamber, and so that's uh, intuitive. The second mode is a little harder. We found uh, that the motion as viewed by the eigenvector lies in this direction parallel to the hypotenuse. The numerical quantity we got was 18 hertz. If we use our classical ideas as an approximation that the motion in this direction characterized by this longest dimension would give rise to a frequency then you take 2L, and the hypotenuse is 14 meters, so you get 28 meters on the hypotenuse. And you come up with this estimate of 11.8 hertz. Now that's low because with our simple classical idea over here, we're assuming that the uh, fluid really is moving in this uh, characteristic distance here as if it were a one-dimensional tube, whereas in fact much of the fluid is moving in shorter uh, distances here, and therefore the numerical result here is likely to be much more accurate. But our simple single element model is probably going to be too high in frequency because we've constrained things a bit. It would be interesting to divide this up into several uh, smaller such elements and find the result from that. That would only require a couple more degrees of freedom, uh, actually six in total, so you'd be solving for the first frequency of a six by six matrix, and that's conceivable. I haven't done that in this lecture, but I'll leave that for homework. Then, 
The third mode is basically the transverse mode uh, spanning the short direction of the closed chamber. We got a number about 32 hertz. When you use that short dimension, you get 23. And again, that's uh, a little slower than uh, the better numerical result here because the assumption again is that there's a, a one-dimensional uh, closed tube here with that characteristic dimension uh, for half wavelength and it assumes all the air has to move that far whereas there are other shorter characteristic dimensions. So it looks to me as if we have gotten results here that um, are okay and we've passed the sanity check. I'd like to look at some one-dimensional problems now in our problem session. And we'll look at this uh, one-dimensional element in several ways. First of all, let's create an acoustic finite element that's a line element. And I'm thinking of what goes on in a tube of fluid with length L and constant area A. This solution can be carried out in our finite element approach rather straightforwardly. We use the same kinds of shape functions that have been used in uh, other branches of mechanics, these, these simple um, straight line segments for N1 and N2. Remembering that these have to have a unit value at the home node and zero value at the other nodes. Therefore, the velocity potential within the domain of that line element is given here where you use the nodal values as interpolated by those two shape functions here with the wiggly underscore. We developed a general theory uh, in n dimensions for the uh, acoustic finite element. So we'll just use that theory now in our one dimensional case. For instance, the uh, acoustic uh, pressure, the stiffness term, had gradients of the, uh, the pressure field in it, and those become gradients of the shape function. The volume integration reduces down in one dimension to the cross-sectional area of the tube times the um, axial coordinate direction, and then the derivatives on the shape functions. When we put in our simple shape functions, we can solve for the K11 term over here. Uh, derivative of that linear shape function gives you minus 1 over L. Likewise, minus 1 over L, and you end up with this acoustic stiffness. The off-diagonal term is negative. K22 turns out to be the same as K11, not surprisingly, since you have a symmetric little element. I'll gather the various acoustic stiffness terms into a single matrix. And here's our assembly. And this has the form found in other line elements, such as in structural mechanics for the truss, where you get the pattern of ones and minus ones. It's characteristic of a line element in that you have an input-output sort of a situation where what goes into one node comes out the other. Now the mass terms are related to these integrals of the shape functions. And ultimately, this is a kinetic energy type of expression. We'll bring it down into one dimension here and, sh and change from a volume integral to a line integral in the x direction, but multiplied by the cross-sectional area. When we put those shape functions in, this time the calculation is a little bit more tedious. Uh, for computers, of course, general formulations aren't any problem like this. But you get terms such as this one, and uh, they're volume related. Now I'll do the remaining two mass terms. And uh, the cross. Uh, term M12, the off-diagonal term is given here, and then M22, which is identical to M11. I gather these into the assembled mass matrix, and you get this form. 
and when added up, these add up to the total volume of the element. Density has conveniently canceled out, so uh, we've lost the dimensional nature that we might have preferred on this term, but it is uh, a mass-like term now converted into volumetric uh, dimensions. Then we can take our inertia term put on the right side of the equation of motion, bring in the acoustic pressure or stiffness terms, and then we have our eigenvalue problem. This can then be solved for the free vibration of a single element, or it can be assembled into a larger uh, tube of fluid with varying boundary conditions. Now, I've currently shown it with uh, rigid walls uh, on a single element, but obviously you might have other things in mind. Our second problem is going to be to actually find the uh, frequencies in such a closed one-dimensional tube of fluid. And we'll take it with fixed boundary conditions, a, a rigid wall at either end of this single line element model. Later we're going to use more complicated models and subdivide this. That'll give us some idea of how many elements are needed to give you a better approximation to what we suspect is the sine wave solution here. So this becomes now a, a task of just solving the eigenvalue problem that we already posed in the previous figure. You collect terms, bring them together. We've canceled the cross-sectional area. That makes sense that the area would both affect the stiffness and the mass terms in, a, in the same proportional way, so that disappears. Then you end up with this um, equation where lambda now is the uh, eigenvalue in the problem, k squared L squared. A non-trivial solution requires that the determinant of that dynamical matrix be zero. And when we do that, we get this polynomial, which is a quadratic, and as we would have expected after some algebra, you are able to factor out a uh, constant lambda proportional to the frequency. And the solutions to this are 0 and 12. Now, as you can imagine, the 0 solution here is going to be the constant pressure mode. Solving for uh, the frequency, which would be uh, in hertz here, we get zero for the constant pressure mode and then this ratio. We'll get a physical interpretation of that uh, non-zero eigenvalue in a minute. We'll look, and look at the frequencies and compare with the exact theory. But for the moment, let's complete the eigenvalue problem by finding the eigenvectors. And here is the equation of motion. If we put in the zero eigenvalue, then you're going to get this set of equations, and they yield the constant pressure mode shown here. The second mode, uh, when you put in lambda to be 12, yields this set of equations. You get an eigenvector minus 1, 1, and then you get this, which is what we would have expected, the half wave of a, an approximation to a traveling sine wave superposed in this closed chamber to give stationary waves or standing waves, but uh, only involving the half wavelength, so that on the opposite cycle of motion it would do that. Let's compare our numerical result with the exact answer, which we can get from the classical argument about frequency in a closed tube of length L when there are reflective walls. We just arrived at this frequency for our problem as a result of an eigenvalue solution. This is a classical answer for a uh, frequency that is C over 2L. When you do that ratio, you find it comes out a little greater than 1, so that indeed the numerical answer is about 10% higher than the exact answer. Now this would make Rayleigh happy because uh, some 100 years ago he showed that if you 
use an approximate solution in vibration problems like this, and you constrain the field variable artificially, don't allow it to have its exact shape, uh, then you will get a higher estimate for frequency than the exact value. So that means that Rayleigh would be happy to hear that we're still making errors in the same direction that he proposed many years ago. After finding that our line element is reasonably good uh, for predicting frequencies and mode shapes, then the question would be, how many line elements would you need to get, say, 1% accuracy on the uh, frequency in a closed tube? So I'm picking a tube that's 10 meters long. It's a big, you know, like a room size again. And uh, we've done a solution with a single element. Uh, now, if you use two elements, this is kind of interesting because um, you're going to find that, <laughs> that the two line elements are really no better than one because they must be, by symmetry, used to continue the approximation in the way shown with a, with a zero crossing in the middle, and therefore two elements uh, uh, in this tube are no better than one. Now, you have three degrees of freedom now instead of two. But I'll, I'll show the mathematics of this solution that's a little bit degenerate, and, and then I will quote results on up to nine elements. And this was done in a classroom setting with a couple students, uh, Michael Dungan and Andrew Fleer, so they were very helpful in carrying out the more detailed calculations. Here is the case with two elements end-to-end -end representing the um, closed tube. Now, the ends have boundary conditions that there's no volumetric flow into or out of the tube, so that gives you the nice reflective boundary condition. Uh, it's interesting to note then that this node here, the uh, condition to be placed at this location circled on the right would be the volume flow that would be external volume flow imposed there. And so these internal nodes are nice in that if you don't add flow, they become zero as well at this location. So the three unknowns in the problem are indeed the three field values for the velocity potential, and this problem is already posed in the proper form, in the so-called standard form for solution. Uh, the stiffnesses overlap at the center node, the mass terms overlap, and you get that superposition effect where you get an increased value at the center node. Now, the condition for a solution of that uh, eigenvalue problem is that the determinant of the matrix of coefficients be zero. So that will lead to a cubic polynomial in terms of an eigenvalue lambda. I show that here. Again, you can see that there's a uh, common factor of lambda of zero, which corresponds to the constant pressure mode and at a zero frequency. When you solve, you get 3 and 12 as the two other roots. Uh, when we write those out, we find this um, measure of the first mode, and now we get a measure of the second mode. And the interesting thing is that the first mode is not particularly improved because uh, just of the difficulty in approximating the sine wave with a very low number of straight line segments. Uh, the length L is the length of a single element in my um, calculation above here, so you have to watch out what the tube length is. The tube length would really be 2L. And notice that the second frequency here is identical with the single element formulation. So after doing this, I challenged a class a year ago to carry on this calculation to higher numbers of elements, and that was done with great style by a couple of my students. Now let me show you the table of results for our models of varying accuracy level within this closed tube. First of all, the number of elements listed here uh, really is the number of elements required for a half wavelength, and therefore, if you want to make comparisons with how many elements are needed per full wavelength, remember that uh, it'll be twice this number. There were models done with two noted linear elements, and then there were models done with three noted parabolic elements. These are called higher order elements. 
to compare those fairly, you must remember there are more degrees of freedom on the three element case and, and to fairly compare, sometimes you need to adjust then for how many degrees of freedom are in the comparison, not just how many elements there are. Let's concentrate on the two noted elements first. You've seen uh, the case with a single element through the half wavelength through the cavity uh, length and then you've seen two elements. Both give the same error. They really um, are giving you the same shape in total for the um, full sine wave. If you go to three elements in the uh, cavity, then you get engineering accuracy of 4.6 percent. I call it that because anything less than 5 percent is often useful in typical engineering applications, so most engineers would be interested in here on down. Um, that would actually correspond to six elements per wavelength. I notice that uh, a lot of literature um, uh, calls out five elements per wavelength as adequate, and then that would be an error somewhere between these two. Uh, when you sit down and sketch a uh, five element model of a full sine wave, you see that it's a bit of an awkward figure and, and yet that is often the uh, standard um, recommendation. As you go up to uh, four elements in our cavity, you reduce the error, five, six, until with seven elements you get the one percent accuracy that we've stated at the outset that we're interested in. So uh, seven elements in that closed chamber is really quite a fine model, it would, would uh, correspond to 16, sorry, to 14 elements per full wave, and that is quite a, a detailed model. You wouldn't need this accuracy in conventional hearing problems or anything that would be um, uh, a psychological or a physiological effect because the human generally senses noise on a logarithmic scale and 1% accuracies are not really needed. Uh, if you had some kind of acoustically induced stress in a structure though, then you might want to model this fine uh, because the structure will respond a little bit more in an absolute sense to whatever pressure levels are present. So it's conceivable someone would, would use that accuracy. When we go to three noted um, uh, elements, then a single three noted element would give uh, this accuracy of 10%. That actually uses three degrees of freedom, however, so we really should compare that with using two line elements uh, that are constant uh, strain elements that we've developed, uh, the two noted linear elements. So that would be a fair comparison there. If you go to two of these three noted elements in the um, chamber, then uh, you get this accuracy, which is giving 1% accuracy now. Uh, that should be compared with the case where you had four uh, of those constant velocity elements. Um, this then becomes a good study in what you might call p-convergence, when you compare in a crossways in this direction going to higher order polynomials, which means higher degree uh, polynomials in this case we get this uh, increased accuracy. There's some expense in element formulation and uh, handling and so currently the linear elements are still winning in most problems in acoustics and uh, heat conduction, uh, but the higher order elements do have some promise in accuracy. Uh, be interesting to see how that goes as, as time goes on. Okay, so we complete our discussion at this point on our table. My fourth example is in response to a question that I had in my mind as to the comparison between the piston face pressure that we developed in our first lecture, kind of a simple theory, and then comparing that with the velocity potential solution that you would get if you applied it on the face of a piston in one dimension. 
the question's a little bit contrived, and some of you might have some trouble seeing what I'm doing, <laughs> because it's not a clean problem. I'm, I'm taking two different theories and trying to apply them to the same problem, and I have to move the one theory, namely the potential theory, uh, into the same area as the pressure on a piston face, which is moving harmonically and, and setting up a chain of waves. So it's fairly contrived. Uh, here I show at the top of this figure the one-dimensional piston problem. We found that by using an exact solution for traveling waves on a, um, on a moving piston face that we could evaluate the pressure at the face only. So it was a very local solution and, and a one-dimensional solution. And the pressure on the face of the piston was rho um, c times the velocity there. Uh, exact for one dimension. But on the other hand, in our velocity potential, uh, which we just looked at, we found that we could find the pressure anywhere in a field uh, and relate it to the velocity potential. Now, I've broken the velocity potential into the spatial part and then the uh, basically what was once the time-dependent part here, but in a harmonic solution. So what I'm going to do in the solution is basically simplify the, um, the velocity potential solution to the case of that of a piston and then evaluate it on the piston face and see what we get. Well, the velocity potential solution, if you presume there's a chain of waves moving out um, from a piston face, then you would have a constant times this exponential, complex exponential, which is the right moving wave. And in one dimension, we only need to carry the x variable. Now, uh, this will satisfy Helmholtz's equation. You can put that in and see that it is a solution. So therefore, we can ask for the pressure at a specific point as a special case. The pressure in a traveling plane wave would therefore be given by this next equation. And here you would have a uh, function of the x-coordinate um, and the uh, constants that we saw before. The, I've written the pressure as if it might be in three dimensions. In other words, you might have a plane wave moving in three dimensions. So you're only exciting things happening as a function of the x-coordinate, where this is the x-direction. And, um, of course, I, I want to simplify that rather quickly and get rid of the y and z dependence because uh, you wouldn't expect the pressure to vary in the y and z direction on such a plane wave. Now, now I've reduced the 3D problem down to a 1D problem, really. If I regroup the terms in here, I identify that that's actually the velocity of the uh, acoustic wave any, anywhere in the space, in the xt space. I write that here. But then if I say that my piston is driving this wave and is at x equals 0 here, uh, then uh, instead of this general field of uh, traveling waves moving out, I look right at the face of the piston by putting 0 in for x. I indeed get exactly what the piston law gave. So. It's a little bit contrived, but at least there's consistency then between the velocity potential idea and then our simpler uh, piston face uh, solution that we had earlier. By the way, that piston face example can be used as an approximation in three-dimensional problems when the frequency gets high because locally that's what the uh, acoustic field um, acts like as, this, as if that local piston is driving it.